thank you to the chairman. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to this uh, really excellent program. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, second of all, a small uh, apology for changing the title of my talk from what was at least originally advertised. I had an idea that maybe in this summer school setting it would be a good idea to present something a little bit more, say, uh, elementary and, and probably less technical than what I'd originally planned to talk about. Uh, and that's this, uh, uh, the, this topic of um, stability of periodic waves. So periodic waves, by periodic waves I mean spatially periodic standing wave solutions of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, it's a topic which I am new to and uh, so far don't have so much to say about the problem yet, but what I do have to say is uh, part of joint work with uh, Stefan Lacos in Toulouse and Taipeng Tsai from UBC. Okay, so this is just the, the program. So what I'll do is I'll describe these uh, periodic wave solutions for a one-dimensional NLS. Uh, and then describe the uh, various different variational characterizations of these periodic waves. So anybody familiar with stability theory knows there's a close connection between variational characterizations and uh, stability. Uh, after discussing uh, the variational characterizations and the related notion of, of the orbital stability of these waves, I will move on to discuss a weaker notion of stability, which is a linear or spectral notion of stability for periodic waves. And then finish with some open questions. So this is a, a business where I have many more questions than answers. So maybe you can think of this as an invitation, if, if interested, to some uh, problems which I think are interesting and challenging problems. Okay, so the equation is very simple. It's just the one-dimensional cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation in both the focusing and defocusing forms. So I guess when B is plus one, it's focusing. E is minus one, it's a defocusing. Of course, as with any uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you're interested in its standing wave or solitary wave solutions, which are solutions of this form. If we restrict ourselves to uh, standing waves which have real valued uh, profile function, which I'm going to do in this talk, so from now on only the real valued periodic waves will be discussed, um, then, of course, this profile function satisfies a very simple ODE which you can, it's a nice little exercise to draw the classical mechanics pictures. You can figure out what all the different possible periodic solutions look like. Uh, but even more than that, this equation is so special that you have special function descriptions of all these real valued periodic waves. In particular, they're all, uh, at least the non-trivial ones are all Jacobi elliptic functions. Uh, depending on the sign, uh, the sign of the nonlinearity. In the defocusing case, there are sinoidal waves, and in the focusing case, there are their conoidal or denoidal wave uh, elliptic functions. Uh, of course, it should maybe not be so surprising that we have explicit uh, special function representations of these, uh, uh, these periodic waves because um, famously, this is a so-called completely integrable PDE, a completely integrable Hamiltonian system. It's one of the few examples of this, uh, this phenomenon. And so you see a lot of things like uh, explicit formulas. Um, as a consequence of the complete integrability, for example, you can, in principle, write down infinitely many independent conserved quantities for this cubic NLS and uh, so on, many other properties. So somehow, my uh, even though I'm, I'm considering the cubic here, my philosophy is to 
avoid the integrability as much as possible with the idea that uh, one wants to be able to say things for potentially non-integrable equations if you change the nonlinearity a little bit. Nevertheless, the integrability is going to crop up in various places. Okay, so the, the periodic waves are these uh, Jacobi elliptic functions. If you haven't seen them before, this is uh, some idea of what they look like. Uh, they come with this parameter, little k, which ranges between 0 and 1, from which you can determine their period through this uh, elliptic integral. Uh, well, how is it? Four times this integral is the period of the sinoidal and the conoidal waves, and the denoidal one has half that period. Uh, for a relatively small value of the parameter k, in fact, you can see the conoidal looks a lot like a cosine, the sinoidal looks a lot like a sine, and the denoidal just looks like a little bump away from 1. But if you take uh, more extreme uh, values of the parameter k, you see more localization of these uh, profiles become much more sharply peaked. And in particular, this, um, this denoidal wave starts to look more and more like the classical soliton on the real line, which is exponentially localized. But of course, these are all periodic functions. They repeat endlessly in space. Okay, and the main, uh, oh, and, and obviously the big difference between the denoidal and the sinoidal and the conoidal is that the denoid is a positive solution and the conoidal and sinoidal waves are sign changing. That makes a big difference in the analysis of their stability. All right, and that's the main question I want to address here is uh, the stability of these various different periodic wave solutions. And when you ask about stability, you can ask a bunch of different questions. Uh, for example, you can take different classes of perturbations. So maybe the simplest thing you can do is consider these uh, solutions as spatially periodic solutions of the NL NLS with period equal to the fundamental period of the wave itself. In other words, take perturbations of that wave which have the same period that period will be preserved. Okay. So you can essentially consider NLS on a circle with one of these waves sitting in the circle and make a small perturbation which preserves the periodicity. So you stay on the circle. Uh, another thing you can do is you can consider perturbations of the wave which are some integer multiple of the basic period of the wave. In other words, you're taking several periods on one circle and then considering solutions um, with that periodicity. Uh, and the other class of perturbations you might think about is spatially localized perturbations. So you might think about the periodic wave on the whole real line and just make a little localized perturbation of that and um, ask what happens. Um, that's quite a different question than stability against the period of multiperiodic perturbations. And so I'm not going to address that one here. I'm going to stick to periodic and the multiply periodic perturbations. OK, and somehow the, the motivation here is that for solitons, let's say, of the of nonlinear Schrodinger equations on the whole space, on the line or on the plane or whatever, this is uh, the stability analysis of these objects is a very classical business, has a, a long history and is, has been developed into a more or less a fine art. But the problem um, in a periodic setting is, I think, not nearly as well understood. And so there are lots of open questions. OK, so let me be a little bit more precise about stability. OK, so let's take one of these periodic waves. Uh, as people probably know in this, uh, in this room, a uh, natural notion of stability for standing waves is the orbital stability. More precisely, your equation has some symmetries. We have translation symmetry, and we have a phase symmetry. And so a standing wave really belongs to a, a larger symmetry orbit consisting of all the translates and phase rotations of this uh, wave. And it's really the stability of this orbit that you want to consider rather than the individual wave. OK, so just a little notation. Let's consider functions which are uh, 
locally in H1 functions, so in the energy space, if you like, and which have a given period capital T. So by um, orbital stability in this space PT, I just mean the usual statement of orbital stability, which is written here, where we are measuring, of course, it's very important what norm you measure the perturbations <coughs> in, or measure, measure the perturbations in, in the energy norm, in H1, unless otherwise specified. So if you start close to one of the waves, you will stay, as measured in the same norm, close to the orbit of that wave for all time. That's orbital stability. Uh, there's a much weaker notion of stability which you can look at, which is a purely linear notion. So you linearize the equation around the standing wave. You look at the linearized operator, in particular you look at the spectrum of the linearized operator. And the, the notion of spectral stability is just that this spectrum stays purely on the imaginary axis. So at the level of the linearized equation, you don't have any exponentially growing modes. So that's a spec uh, spectral stability. And it shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself that the spectral is weaker than orbital in the sense that orbital stability requires spectral stability. If you had exponentially growing modes at the linear level, then in reasonable, under reasonable conditions you can bootstrap that to a, a nonlinear a contradiction to this statement of orbital stability. So it's a much weaker notion. Okay, and the other uh, little piece of notation I have to introduce is uh, this uh, notation A2K. So A2K stands for um, half antiperiodic. Okay, so to be more precise, this uh, synoidal and conoidal waves, if you look at their picture, oops, they have an extra symmetry like the sine and the cosine. So if you go, ha if you go halfway through the period, you just pick up a minus sign. So they, they are half antiperiodic functions. And moreover, this uh, family of half antiperiodic functions, because the, the nonlinearity is then, per uh, the, the nonlinear potential in the equation is then periodic, that's a preserved class of functions. So you can ask about the stability of these objects within this subspace of half antiperiodic, um, half antiperiodic functions as well. Okay, so let me try to summarize in one uh, kind of crowded slide some things that we know about this stability question. One wave at a time. So let's start with the synoidal waves. So this is the defocusing case. Uh, so if you restrict, as, we, as I just uh, indicated, if you restrict to these, this family of half antiperiodic functions, then there's a result which says, a uh, result of Galle and Haragus, which says that the synoidal waves are orbitally stable. This is essentially an argument which, <coughs> which follows the classical lines, for example, <coughs> of a grillakis shata strauss type argument. Um, more, somehow more, uh, more spectacularly, and certainly much more uh, integrably, so if you're willing to uh, really exploit the integrable structure, uh, there was an, a nice observation made by uh, Botman, de Koenig, and Nivala, and somehow um, formalized by Galley and Palinovsky, that by exploiting the integrable structure, in particular exploiting one higher order conserved quantity, one higher order conserved functional, uh, one can obtain an orbital stability result, not just in for functions, uh, perturbations <coughs> of the same period, but in fact perturbations of any multiple of the period of the synoidal waves. So I'll say a little bit more about how that goes later. One thing to notice is that because they're using a higher order functional, which lives at the level of H2, this is an H2 level stability statement. So this is H2 orbital stability and doesn't say anything about the energy space. Okay, so one uh, thing that I'll present a little bit later on is uh, somehow much, much weaker result. So I'm going to look at the spectral stability. Certainly if you have orbital stability, you have spectral stability. So that it's spectral stability is a known result from this uh, integrable, integrability-based work of uh, Galle and uh, Palinovsky. Uh, but I'm going to try to give a proof of at least the spectral stability 
of the sinusoidal wave in a way that does not really rely on the integrability, at least not too much. So that's the philosophy is to avoid in integrability as much as possible. Okay, the conoidal wave, so that's the focusing case. Again, there was a result of uh, uh, Galay and Aragus, at least for some range of parameters, about the orbital stability against half antiperiodic functions of the conoidal wave. Again, it's a grillakis shata strauss type argument. So I will, I will show you, a, let's say, an alternate proof and one that applies to the full range of the, of the parameters. Uh, roughly speaking, they're looking at the local minimization problem, but in fact, I'll show you we have a global minimization property for the conoidal wave among half antiperiodic functions. Uh, if you remove this uh, antiperiodicity assumption, you go to the full period, then we don't have any results about orbital stability. That's an open question. But at least we can say something about spectral stability. And in fact, it turns out that the spectral stability was established uh, by Ivy and, and La Fortune, again, somehow exploiting the integrable structure in a, in a heavy way and explicitly computing the entire spectrum of the linearized operator. So with that, I, I will indicate um, what I think of as a, a less integrable way of getting at least this spectral stability uh, for the conoidal wave. And then finally, okay, so at least at the spectral level, at the linear level, you can see that the conoidal wave is stable with respect to its own period perturbations. Uh, it turns out that if you go to higher period, higher multiples of that period, then the conoidal waves become unstable. This is somehow known uh, a long time ago in the 70s by some work of uh, Rowlands, which we... Uh, which we somehow um, formalized to give a, a rigorous proof of the instability. So if time permits, I'll say a little bit about where the instability comes from. And just to complete the picture, there's um, not much to say about the denoidal wave. So the denoidal waves, that's, that's the positive one. In some sense, its theory is very much like the theory of the usual ground state soliton, the real line, because it has this uh, constrained minimization property. And so it's automatically orbital, orbitally stable with respect to its own period perturbations, and it's very easy to show that it, it's unstable against higher multiple perturbations. Okay. So the first thing to discuss a little bit about is the orbital stability and related to that uh, variational characterizations <coughs> of periodic waves. Of course, these are everybody's uh, favorite conserved functionals for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the energy the mass, and sometimes the momentum. I'm deliberately leaving off this list all the infinitely many more you get from integrability because I want to avoid them as much as possible. And uh, it's <coughs> certainly the case that if you look at the equation for the solitary wave standing wave profile, then it's a critical point equation for some combination of the energy and the mass, sometimes called the action. And it's a, a sort of cl it's a classical uh, result that, uh, going back to the 80s, that if you can conclude that your standing wave is a local minimizer of this functional, subject to a constraint of the mass or maybe the momentum or maybe both, uh, then then you have orbital stability. Okay. That's, that's a loose statement. Of course, you need, you need something about non-degeneracy or about compactness of minimizing sequences. But basically, if you're a constrained minimum and the constraints are conserved quantities, then you're orbitally stable. So it makes sense to look at the various constrained minimization problems in the periodic setting. Uh, so if you try the obvious thing, you constrain the mass and minimize the energy among functions of a given period then that will give you your denoidal waves, the positive ones, at least for some range of parameters, and in the focusing case. But in the defocusing case, you won't get anything. You just get a constant. So a natural thing to try if you want to find the sign-changing waves, the conoidal or the sinoidal, natural thing to try is maybe to impose this extra anti-symmetry, half anti-symmetry condition, minimize among half anti-symmetric functions. And indeed, if you do this, it will yield 
and I'll show you on the next slide, it will yield the conoidal waves in the focusing case. Okay, so you can say, and in fact, this is, you can see this is not a, a local minimum, this is a global minimum. So the conoidal wave is a global minimizer, constraint minimizer. Uh, in the defocusing case, however, you don't get the synoidal waves. In fact, you get a plane wave, a complex value solution. So it's not completely clear how you might, in a useful way, generate the synoidal waves variationally. One possibility would be to add one more constraint, which is zero momentum constraint. But I don't actually have a good, I don't have a, a nice proof of this, or indeed any proof of this, uh, this fact that if you constrain, if you restrict to half antiperiodic, constrain both the mass and the momentum, then you'll finally get, get these uh, synoidal waves as your minimizers. Okay, you just say a word about <coughs> the variational characterization of the conoidal wave. So I said it's, a, it's a, a constrained minimizer of the energy. You constrain the mass and you restrict to half antiperiodic functions. And here you can see <coughs> uh, right away the difference between uh, dealing with these sign changing solutions and dealing with usual positive ground state solutions. So what you might be tempted to do when confronted with a minimization problem like this is you might immediately, in your minimizing sequence, you might replace u by its absolute value, which you know, which you know does not increase the energy and preserves the constraint. But of course the problem here is that destroys the anti-periodicity, so that's an illegal operation. So instead what you can do is you can use a kind of rearrangement on the Fourier side. And so if you write the function in terms of Fourier modes, because of the half anti-periodicity, in fact, you'll just get the odd modes. And you make a rearrangement of this type on the Fourier side. It's uh, immediate that you preserve the L2 norm, you preserve the uh, kinetic energy, and so the name of the game is to show that this procedure increases the L4 norm, which you can do with just a, a little bit of combinatorics and linear algebra. Okay, so you get this global minimization problem for the conoidal wave. As a corollary, you get an orbital stability result for the conoidal wave within the half antiperiodic functions. Um, and let me just emphasize again, if you remove the half antiperiodicity assumption, as far as I know, this is an open question whether or not this is an orbitally stable wave. For the uh, synoidal wave, uh, we didn't have the, variational, the same kind of variational structure as for the conoidal wave. But as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Botman, De Konig, and Navala, and Galay, and Palinowski have used the uh, exploited this higher order functional which comes from the integrability to say very strong things about the stability of the synoidal wave. So more precisely, uh, they take this functional here, this uh, higher order functional lives at the level of H2, together with some combination of the mass and the energy. I didn't say it on this slide, but of course this is a conserved functional for the cubic NLS. That's consequence of the integrability. And it turns out that the synoidal wave is in fact a local minimizer of this functional without any constraints and with respect to uh, perturbations or within the class of functions which are periodic of any multiple of the basic period of the synoidal wave. So this is some kind of um, integrable systems miracle, I guess. And so you can then build, use this functional to control perturbations to get an orbital stability result. So their, their conclusion is that the synoidal wave is in fact orbitally stable with respect to any multiple perturbation, uh, perturbations which are periodic with any multiple of the basic period as measured in H2. H2 because you need to use this function. Uh, so as far, as far as I know, if you want to make a statement of orbital stability in the energy norm and the H1 norm, then that's still an open question. Okay, so that's I think all we can say about orbital stability for now. Let's move on to this weaker notion of spectral or linear stability. 
okay, so just uh, to show you uh, the linearized operator. So if you take one of these uh, periodic wave solutions and you linearize around it, probably most of you have seen something like this before, the linearized operator has this form here, uh, this uh, uh, made, made up of these two, um, two self-adjoint uh, Schrodinger or sturm liouville type operators, L plus and L minus. But as anybody who's worked in this business knows, the, the relationship between the spectrum of these self-adjoint operators and the spectrum of the truly linearized operator is a somewhat complicated one. Anyway, uh, spectral stability, when I say spectral stability, I mean that the spectrum of this true linearized operator lies entirely on the imaginary axis. It's certainly a necessary condition for any kind of, any other kind of stability. Okay, and the situation is, is kind of like this in general. Um, in these uh, stability for Schrodinger uh, standing wave problems, you normally have a certain amount of information about the spectrum of the self-adjoint operators, the L plus and the L minus, which make up the linearized operator, but not so much about the, the spectrum of the true linearized operator. And the, the name of the game is kind of to go from one to the other. In the case of the cubic in one dimension, in fact, we can be very explicit indeed about the spectrum of the the low, at least the low energy spectrum of the operators L plus and L minus. Uh, and it's essentially all summarized in this picture, which I'll try to explain. Uh, so essentially what you're seeing here is, is some kind of um, another algebraic miracle, which is presumably connected in some way with integrability. And that miracle is that if you consider these the self-adjoint operators, the L plus and the L minus, for the three different families of elliptic functions, they're all just translates of each other. And so they all have the same eigenfunctions. And so from this very simple but um, algebraically uh, amazing fact, you can pretty easily generate explicitly all the low, the low end of the spectrum of these operators. So you can start, for example, with the L minuses over here. You can look at the zero eigenvalues. So the fact that you have Sn as a zero eigenvalue of L minus for Sn, that's a consequence of the phase invariance. So you get the zero here and the zero here and the zero here just by phase invariance, and then just by translation, these become eigenfunctions for the other operators as well. And you can play the same game for the L pluses. In this case, it's the derivatives of the waves which give you zero eigenvalues, and you can translate those to generate all the other low eigenvalues except that you will be missing some, and it's easy to see that you're missing some by counting the zeros. In other words, by sturm liouville theory. So if you look, for example, here at this der derivative of Sn up here, you count the number of times it crosses zero. As you go around the circle, it crosses twice, so it can't be the ground state. The ground state has to be positive. So you know there's something below, and with a little bit of diligence, you can compute exactly what that is, in fact. So you can compute this, uh, zero I this uh, ground state eigenfunction as well. Uh, and then the last piece of information on this picture, I guess, is the, uh, these uh, subspaces up here. So uh, I explained before what P2K and A2K are. So P2K, those are the half periodic functions. A2K is half antiperiodic functions. And you can make a further decomposition into odd and even because the conoidal wave is even, the sinusoidal wave is odd, so their squares are even, so these are subspaces which are also preserved by the linearized evolution. Okay, and may maybe the other, the other thing you can see immediately from this picture is why the sign-changing periodic waves are different than the um, positive ground state that you might be more familiar with. And it's just for a very simple reason that you have too many negative eigenvalues. So look over here, for example, for the L minus Sn, you have two eigenvalues below zero. Uh, and for L plus, you have another one. And if you think about the usual 
conservation laws that you can exploit the mass, the momentum, maybe the momentum and the energy. You just don't have enough, uh, don't have enough conservation laws to control the negative directions. So that's kind of the, the essential uh, dip extra difficulty here in the periodic setting. Okay, so let me just sketch an argument which I hope relies as little as possible on the integrable structure for showing, based on this picture, that you have spectral stability for the sinoidal wave and the conoidal wave with respect to perturbations of the same period. I should point out that this, this argument that I'm going to show actually breaks down at some, uh, at some range of the parameters for the conoidal wave although in fact we know that the conoidal wave is still stable beyond that uh, spectrally. Okay. Yes, please. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. So if I do this thing on the whole line, which probably means your, your little k goes to 0 to 1, then doesn't the L plus only have one negative eigenvalue? Why, why do you have three negative eigenvalues? Uh, I think... Uh, which you're zero eigenvalues probably from translation. You're, you're looking at uh, L plus? Right, exactly. The denoidal yeah. waves are those that become the... Oh, the denoidal... Uh, right, okay. So th this is a confusing picture for the denoidal wave because this is, this is already twice the period for the denoidal wave. It's not... Okay. Because the denoidal wave has half the period of the sinoid and the conoid. Okay, and then... That's why you have the extra negative... In fact, in fact the dn in, in this setting, in twice, twice its period, is actually unstable. Okay, but if you would somehow draw it just with the its period, then there would only be one negative. Is that correct? Uh, you, it would be the usual picture you're familiar with from the ground state of the NLS. You'd have zero moles and you have one negative eigenvalue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's see how we can extract at least spectral stability from this, uh, this picture. Okay, so the first thing we do is we break the piece problem up into small pieces using the symmetry. Okay, so I can split the, the periodic functions up uh, into uh, half anti-periodic and half periodic. And it's useful to make a further decomposition of the half periodic into odd and even. And then we can use our variational information we know already from the, lost my pointer, from the half anti-periodic setting, so we know I showed you these variational characterizations earlier, for example, of the conoidal wave, which says that it's a minimizer, constrained minimizer among half anti-periodic functions. And so this is enough in, within this subspace, the A2K, to give you the spectral stability. Uh, for the sinoidal wave, we didn't have the variational characterization, but you can nevertheless, uh, by using just by direct computation, more or less, you can show that it's not necessarily a global minimizer, but some kind of a local constrained minimizer. And that's enough to give you the stability in A2K. Okay. So the A2K part is sort of the classical part. That's the, that's the part that's related to variational characterization. Uh, P2K minus, uh, if you go back to the previous picture, you'll see there are no negative eigenvalues in there. So this, there's no problem. It's automatically stable. And so all the problems that you might have come in this subspace of half periodic even functions. So here you need to do something which is not coming from variational information. So here's what you can do. You can use a very simple uh, coercivity or uh, sometimes it's called Krein signature argument to conclude the following. If you can find some eigenfunction in this subspace which has negative energy in this sense here, so it's negative energy from the point of view of the self-adjoint operator, then that eigenfunction will somehow use up the entire negative subspace that you have for the self-adjoint operator and so you can't have anything else that's unstable. So this is some, some kind of, sim just a simple version of, uh, of, a Krein, of a Krein signature eigenvalue count due to, uh, for example, Capitula, Kebrakides, and Sandstein. So if you can find just one eigen, eigenfunction with the negative energy, 
then that kills the possibility of any unstable eigenvalues. And uh, here it is. And this again is presumably some integrability rearing its head once again. Is you can just write down some, some uh, appropriate eigenfunction. So here it is in the case of Sn, down below in the case of Cn. You can compute directly that this is a, an eigenfunction with purely imaginary eigenvalue with negative energy. So by this Krein signature argument, it rules out any other unstable eigenvalues. So in a sense, uh, this is probably, probably coming from integrability in some sense, but at least the problem is reduced to, to a single eigenfunction in a single subspace. OK, so in uh, just uh, the last few minutes, let me talk about the instability of the conoidal wave. So uh, what we just showed is that the conoidal wave is stable, in, at least in a spectral sense with respect to perturbations which preserve its period. So now we go in the other direction. We consider perturbations which are a very high multiple of its period. Or if you prefer, we're putting a whole bunch of conoidal waves, or one, one conoidal wave with many periods on the circle. And then we make a small perturbation of this guy. OK, and here's a theorem which says that if you do that, if you take sufficiently high multiple of the period perturbations, then indeed you have unstable eigenvalues. So this is a, a, it's a kind of perturbation argument, which I'll, I'll explain a little about in a moment. Uh, and somehow you, you do the perturbation theory, and it boils down to some heavy, heavy uh, elliptic function computations. And we did these computations, and we were very happy to find this instability. And then we learned that the, these heavy, integrable, uh, heavy uh, elliptic function computations were already done in 1974 by Roland. Uh, although his argument was more or less uh, formal. So um, we, we made the perturbation theory rigorous, but the computation was essentially done in the 70s. Uh, and here's what's behind it. So what's behind it is, uh, is uh, Floquet theory. Uh, so Floquet theory is is how you describe, for example, the spectrum of a linear operator with respect to localized or L2 perturbations on the entire line when you have periodic potentials. It says that you, your spectrum is made up of these uh, bands which come from considering uh, reduced problems, this L theta. So you take the linearized operator, you conjugate it with a phase where it is here, conjugate it with this e to the i theta x. Consider that eigenvalue problem with respect to periodic boundary conditions. And then take the union of all those uh, eigenvalues that come up with respect to this parameter theta that generates the entire L2 spectrum. That's what Floquet theory tells you. So in particular, what you can do is you can use this parameter theta as a kind of perturbation parameter. Uh, perturbing from, in our case, we're going to perturb from theta equals pi over t, which exactly corresponds to the anti-periodic uh, anti subspace. And th the reason for the anti-periodic is because that's where the, the conoidal wave itself lies. So if you take the, uh, the anti-periodic operator, then it has a, a null space. In fact, it has a generalized null space made up of the conoidal wave, appropriately um, phased, uh, and the derivative of the conoidal wave, those lie in the kernel. And as usual, you have gen generalized eigenfunctions corresponding to L plus and L minus as well. And you can do perturbation of this generalized eigenspace at the origin um, away from this uh, anti-period, half anti, or sorry, this anti-periodic value of theta. Use theta as a perturbation parameter. And from this, you, you do, if you do this carefully, you can, you can construct uh, an eigenvalue which is genuinely complex. Uh, non, in fact, non-zero real and imaginary parts. Boils down, as I said, to some calculation involving elliptic functions, which turns out to have been done a long time ago. 
uh, numerically, this is what the spectrum, this is the L2 spectrum, the, uh, the full uh, band spectrum uh, for the conoidal wave. Uh, and so you can see the perturbation coming from the origin in this direction into the complex plane, it's which, which is what this theorem is computing. Uh, and okay, so that, that's the L2 spectrum, but as a consequence, you have some range of theta, some range of this Floquet parameter for which you have unstable eigenvalues. In particular, you can conclude from there that for sufficiently high multiples of the basic period, you have unstable eigenvalues. Okay, so let me finish with some open questions, which, of which there are many in this business, it seems. Let's start with some uh, relatively modest ones. Well, I don't know how modest they are, actually. Uh, so for the sinusoidal wave, uh, we can get the orbital stability um, against half antiperiodic functions, uh, perturbations. So that's a more or less, uh, it's related to variational, more or less classical argument. And by using this elliptic, or sorry, not, by using this um, integrable machinery, we can get the stability against higher perturbations if we go to H2, to the level of H2. So it would be natural to ask whether you can descend to the energy space, whether this property of orbital stability in the energy space holds for the sinusoidal wave. Same question for the conoidal wave. Uh, we know even less about the conoidal wave, and in particular, we don't know orbital stability outside of half antiperiodic perturbations. Uh, we do know that for the conoidal wave, we get instability for a high enough multiple uh, of the period perturbations. So there's some kind of transition there between stability and instability. So it would be natural to ask the following question. Fix, fix the multiple of the period. For which values of this parameter k do you have a stable wave? For which is it unstable? OK, and then um, more, uh, more ambitiously, maybe. I don't know that anything is known about stability of periodic waves against localized perturbations. So that should be a hard problem, I guess. And uh, something that uh, maybe, maybe I want to, to look at next, which is uh, to remove the integrability. So to change the nonlinearity to something non-integrable, where you don't have these uh, higher order functionals to exploit and see if we can see if we can get any kind of orbital stability or even spectral stability in that setting. Okay, thanks for your attention. Are there questions or comments? Just a, a comment. It seems that your fourth question even on a numerical level, if you think of simulations, it's already a hard question. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's a hard question, yes. But you, no. okay, you can dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Since it's a completely integrable equation, I guess you have uh, two solitons? Uh, presumably. Interesting object, do you know any? Uh, well, I, my, my philosophy is to, of course, avoid the integrability as much as possible. And so I, I'm sure if you're, if you're very good at turning this crank, then you can generate formulas for such things. Of course, you, you, can, you can cheat. You can just play with the period, right? But I, guess, but I guess there are there are formulas for more complicated. I would guess there are formulas for more complicated solutions. I know nothing about it. If you forget about the complete integrability, you can still ask the same question. Uh, absolutely, you can. Yes, but we don't really have any answers yet. I have one. Speaking yes. of avoiding <laughs> integrability as much as possible. Uh, you know, on this cubic analysis, mm. there is a global wave closeness in a space which is N2 periodic, not only H1. So it would be quite natural to ask for about this instability or instability in N2. Okay. 
Yes, you can go down and you can go up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, peop people know how to do some things like this on the real line by using integrable transformations, for example. But in the periodic case, of course, but, yes. it's a different, different story. And, and but certainly it's a good yeah, question. At least on H1, you have a... Uh, I'm coming back to integrable spectrum. You did it. Uh, so now you have a complete description of the phase space by this by that capillaire uh, gender okay. variable, which is an analytic infeomorphism from H1 to a phase sequence. Of course, it's it's not that explicit that it uh, looks like. I mean, but but uh, you know, any, anyone who tried to to attack, for instance, this question of uh, stability in H1 orbital stability in H1 through this uh, change of variable? I don't know of any such attempt. No. But it's a good, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Suggestions? If not, we thank the speaker again. <laughs>